afternoon from India. Uh, uh, friends, uh, uh, it's my great privilege to uh, welcome you all uh, to this uh, fourth edition of uh, web series which we've started. It's called Global Franchise Leader Forums. But in every week on Friday, we bring in one of the global experts to you uh, to discuss on future trends, opportunities, and in these COVID times, probably how to, how to overcome the challenges that we are all experiencing. So hope all of you are keeping well. And I'm joined this, uh, this afternoon um, by a very senior colleague from the industry and a, and a, uh, and a leader uh, par excellence, uh, Mr. Rod Young. Uh, Rod brings uh, 35 plus years of franchise experience. Uh, a global leader by far, Gaurav says that he's the, he's the finest franchise leader in the, uh, in the industry. And uh, 35 years back, uh, Rod Young uh, set up uh, DC Strategy, which is one of the foremost companies in Australia with, uh, with the, most of the brands which you see globally uh, being consulted by Rod and his team. I'm also joined by Gaurav, uh, uh, our chairman, uh, Franchise India, and uh, you know uh, Venus Barak, CEO, Fran Global. So uh, thank you, uh, thank you all of you for for joining today. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, Rod, a very warm welcome, and uh, you know we would we would start by having a quick note from you. Uh, what are you experiencing in these times? Right, uh, and uh, Gaurav, Venus, and. Uh... Sachin, thank you for uh, having me. I'm honored to be here. Uh, I see uh, uh, you have built uh, the largest franchise organization in the world in a very, very exciting nation. So I'm very, very pleased to be part of it. Um, and welcome everyone. Um, uh, I'm not going to dwell too much on COVID because it's on the news every night. You know what's happening. Um, but what I want to do is, is uh, just give a, a, a brief overview of how I saw franchising developing post-COVID in the world. Um, and um, there are some very great opportunities. The, the momentum of franchising is continuing to grow. And we are seeing from a more traditional base in the US and, and, uh, uh, and to a degree in Europe, but um, the, the, the franchising phenomenon and the business model is developing right around the world. And uh, over the last 12 months or so, I've saw much more inter intimus, uh, um, uh, impetus in terms of um, uh, franchise expansion across new countries, uh, international expansion. Um, and not just the big American firms, but we're seeing more smaller organizations that are nimble and relevant to the marketplace that are actually expanding their businesses internationally. And uh, I see that opportunity as a long-term trend. And we're seeing as markets emerge, new markets are opening and growing for us. Um, I'll mention a number of the organizations uh, that I'm a director of and uh, give you a bit of background in terms of what I'm actually doing and what those companies are actually doing uh, to take advantage of the opportunities that are invariably going to come out of this. So uh, is that enough of an introduction, uh, uh, Sachin, for now? Absolutely. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Rod, for um, the opening note. Uh, Garvey, you have some opening remarks. So thank you, Rod, for coming over and addressing audience. We have a, a lot of audience on our, our network uh, all through connected with uh, uh, Franchise India has about a 3 million odd uh, audience in India and they're all connected through Facebook. So they all would have uh, enriching what next one hour with from you. And I personally, every time I've we met and I've repeated this, that you are the greatest minds in, in franchising. I have no doubt about it. Uh, and if I, I can really call somebody my guru of uh, franchising, I can use that word for you. And uh, because uh, undoubtedly, the time you spend with us in India for many, many years and uh, the kind of uh, uh, work we have seen, the kind of dedication you've shown for the industry. And uh, so I have a highest respect for that. I think in a Franchise India also, we have rooted a lot of learnings which came from you. Uh, as Venus was mentioning, uh, 
the kind of knowledge series and a lot of forums and the world franchise congress which you addressed so many many events i remember and and uh, it was so kind of you to take a long flights coming from australia and come down especially here and and i have seen you landing in the night and delivering a full day session or couple of days sessions uh, starting early 8 o'clock in the morning so and so we we would be really enjoying this session with you so i completely agree with you that the franchising is changed and it's changing faster than we see you know the formats are changing they're becoming nimble because the consumer is changing because the consumer is asking a very different experience now unlike what we used to do so uh, we are we are just a channel to reach out to our customers franchising is just a channel so as the customer experience would change and uh, all their uh, you know the changes would also have to come in the format of the channel so we are seeing a lot of digitalization a lot of digital concepts and we would like to hear from you what are the three or four five big changes you are seeing in in the industry and and uh, maybe in the formats or the businesses they are they run well look i think one of the big changes is is our consumers have changed um uh, and are becoming much more demanding uh they're doing much more research and i'm 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 talking pre covid here right um um and as a result the way that they're receiving their communication um is changing uh, we've seen the impact this has on the print media as uh, the vast majority of consumers are getting their information um now it's true or false it's um it's it could be false news or it could be facts but the internet is uh, ubiquitous now um and interestingly i believe this covid experience has springboarded the internet 5 years right um, and so what we were going to be doing in 2005 2006 2007 we're actually doing today um and uh, as a result those people that don't have an internet strategy as part of their business um are going to be the big losers going forward because it takes a time for habits to change but covid is changing habits and also there's there is an experience in different markets where habits are changing as well um if we see the the european um uh, economy uh, it, it has some real challenges with it in terms of its aging um and also in terms of the economic structure of europe um the new world in america um had significant growth after the gfc uh, but you can see the problem that they have now and and i see that the big opportunities here are looking what businesses and consumers needs are today and if you're doing what you were doing 5 years ago then um you're you're actually out of business or will be out of business because the relevance of you to your market is going to continue to change so think about your consumers uh go the other point that i make is, is um the opportunity that comes from franchising is founded in its roi its capital gain its risk and its scalability and so if you're in a business and franchising or you're thinking about franchising you've got to think about who your potential investor might be and that potential investor might be a franchisee or it could be a master franchisee or area developer but each each one of these have done an enormous amount of research and so when they come to you my experience is they've looked at at least six or seven opportunities before they've actually contacted you and reached out for information so they're quite knowledgeable and this means that you've got to be relevant not only to your consumers but understand what your competitors are doing and i think what covid has done has brought to bear on many businesses that might have been marginal prior to covid um to put them under great pressure but 
my other observation is this. I'm very optimistic about the future. Um, our global economy is probably going to decline in the ballpark of 10%, right? Now, everybody talks about this recession and depression, but let's remember that 90% of the economy will still exist and consumers will still spend and businesses will still invest. Uh, one of the most interesting things, however, is governments are investing like they have never done before. And so with this 90% of the marketplace, the opportunity is quite great because what I've found, and, and I'm old enough to have gone through a number of recessions, that the number of businesses that fail and turn up their toes and close down as a percentage of total businesses tends to be greater than the decline in the dollars spent in the community. And as a result, the survivors, as this, this period washes out, the survivors in this marketplace actually have a, a smaller market, but less competitors. And we know the golden rule of business. If you're the number one leader in your market and there's 10 competitors, you don't get one tenth of the business and the other nine get one tenth of the business. You get 35 or 40% of the business and then the number two gets 15 or 20 and the number three gets 10 or 15 and then the other seven scramble for business. This pandemic, like many recessions, is going to cull the bottom 20% of businesses. Right? Um, and uh, the result is, what are your strategies to survive? And um, I see this is about not putting your head in the stand, but standing up and looking at where your opportunities are and talking to your customers and asking what are they doing, what are they thinking, what are they spending their money on. So Gaurav, I, I hope that's addressed um, part of your question at least. I completely agree with you and I'll add two points to it. When the, this recession started, I sent to all my thousand brands which we work with one message and say markets would shrink but market share should not. Market share can increase rather. So in the shrink time, you actually increase your market share provided one, you are aggressive and out there. Second, as you rightly said, and I completely echo that, that you need to understand your consumer need, how they change, how their priorities are changing, what, they, what they're consuming now more and how they want to consume. If you're able to change that and quickly adapt to the, this, uh, this situation, and this is not the world is going to change, this uh, interim period. This, would, this has to have a little bit of a strategy to really control next six months or one year away before the things come in. So companies who would have this, what I call short to mid time strategy to float in this time and continue to consolidate their market share would rise. This is one. And second, I will also share with you, Rod, what has happened in India. India, particularly you've seen global recessions and we would like to talk about that. But India, I have seen only not as many recessions as you've seen, but we have seen uh, about two or three recessions which happened in India, especially 2008. Every time a recession came in, franchising grew. And especially in India. Now, I'll tell you the difference between India and Australia. One, India, government spends, but government doesn't spend on a uh, lot of people, doesn't get money from government, right? So when Australian government is spending, it's almost dollar going into every pocket, right? In here, businesses are not given money. Professionals are who lose jobs, are not given jobs or money. Only the very poor and which is very large. And there's a problem because of government of India doesn't cannot feed everybody. It's, we, have, mm. uh, we have a very large poor population. They have to be rightfully first feeding the poor. So what happens, there are four changes come in the market, which all four changes are micro-entrepreneurship. First is the career change. They lose jobs. They will be expecting to have 30 million people who would be out of jobs. But they were earning in March or they were earning through now, or I mean, they would be doing a job in the next two months. So they're still earning, their monies have not gone, their savings have not gone, so they would quickly start looking 
for some business for themselves and most of the time they adapt franchising because it's good for professionals because it's easy to start that's one change second change what i call business change a lot of people who would like to change what they were doing to a new form of businesses like i got a call from somebody today he runs a banquet hall and he wants to change that banquet hall to now a supermarket because he feels that supermarket would still survive banquet <laughs> so that's a business change and third is people dislocate they move from bigger cities to smaller cities and or vice versa or things of that nature because when you change locations you're not looking for a newer opportunity to go into new i rather we have run a program now business from your hometown so india is very large people come to big cities we are now running a program stay in your small city and run a business there itself and you will agree the franchising always in us and other places thrived in smaller markets uh and uh, because in bigger markets you were job creation and people wanted to work for somebody and get good pay uh, paid but in smaller cities you don't have jobs you have to be driving on entrepreneurship and fourth which is which is big happening in india is india last 5 years the biggest competition for franchising was startup you know so everybody wanted to do their own startup and not buy a franchise right so mm-hmm. now time startups would take people would not go for their startup idea they would shift into franchising so these four changes actually are giving a big hype to franchising and you mm-hmm. will see this uh, turning into uh, a lot of people buying into a franchise very very fast so i'll yeah please go yeah, I'd, i'd absolutely agree with that <clears throat> as you know i spend quite a bit of time in the united states um and what i'm saying both in the us and here in australasia is um and as you say historically franchising grows during and after recessions um in this um environment a really interesting thing has happened not only is the lowest paid worker the first in first out um uh, approach but we've seen senior executives losing their job and uh, we work for a number of clients in the US um, very large restaurant food service chains and uh, um uh, businesses involved in uh, in the hardware and distribution industries um and what we've seen is unlike uh, uh, other recessions what's happened is the middle and upper management have actually been taken out of these businesses as they look to as they look, they look, they look to survive now now what that what that's, that's brought into the market in the same situation here we are seeing more and more franchise inquiries from experienced executives they've got a lifestyle to lead um but they have capital they have equity in their homes they have investments um and uh, they're looking for business opportunities that can earn them the equivalent of 150 200 300 400 1/2 a million dollars right um and that caliber of franchise owner is emerging in numbers that i haven't seen before now what this means is a good franchise or that's got the right proposition the right roi and the capital costs are, are reasonable and, and as able to attract a better quality of franchise owner and a better capable manager and people manager and business manager that we've seen that we haven't seen in this market for quite a period of time for the last 10 years or so because employment conditions were so good unemployment was low and as as you know in india uh, the the employment the wages are growing um in 2019 it was hard to hire people because of the demand and the economic demand and now those people are starting to look for opportunities and this is creating opportunities for franchisees who have relevant opportunities available absolutely <clears throat> on the global front you know when you look at global uh, global franchising what what kind of interest you are seeing rod from from uh, franchisers wanting uh, global expansion at this stage is it an opportunity time is it a there look there, there is uh, again we're seeing more opportunity where organizer in those individuals are wondering where they're going to invest their capital 
and what new opportunities might be introduced into their business. Um, one of the roles I played until um, um, I stepped down from the global CEO of Cartridge World for the last 10 years <clears throat> was um, the inquiry that we got around the world, and we're finding this a DC strategy with our Australian clients that we're looking to expand, that are looking to expand internationally. And those, that inquiry uh, is because there are opportunities that are starting to emerge in new economies. Um, there are changes in the economy. Uh, uh, in the US, uh, the opportunities are very, very substantial. And um, as this uh, COVID situation settles, and indeed it will, it'll run its course. Um, I, I see that uh, North America is a really great opportunity. Um, but we're also seeing it in interesting places. Um, uh, only last month, Cartridge World granted a master franchise in Papua New Guinea. Um, not on everybody's radar, not a big market, but <clears throat> our best performing store in the world is in Guatemala. And uh, over the last four or five years, we've put some focus into Africa. And our second largest store in the world is in Tanzania. Um, and uh, we're opening in, uh, in uh, Nairobi. Uh, and uh, also, uh, uh, we've granted a master franchise uh, in French speaking West Africa. So the opportunities to expand your brand uh, on a global basis uh, are continuing to grow as more money flows. Um, when I talk to the investors and the people with money that have been investing and putting cash into funds around the world, there are billions and billions of dollars available for investment um, uh, by big funds. Um, and we're seeing, we see recently here one of our clients was purchased by Bain Capital. Um, the Riverside Group is, is buying multiple brands um, uh, that have been established in countries. And the smart entrepreneurs are actually seeing that they have an opportunity to build a brand within a marketplace and then sell it to one of these aggregation groups that are starting to form around the world and are buying master franchise rights. We are, we are seeing a, quite a bit of surge in terms of at least interest coming in. So because India India is poised to be the uh, top three markets in the world. So we are, we are clearly seeing a, a surge in terms of the interest for companies to come here. Uh, or you, you have some, or because you have some thoughts on it. And, and look, I, I see India as one of the most exciting markets in the world. Um, I, I think that we're starting to see some political challenges in China that um, uh, may interrupt the, uh, the magnet that that business has, been, that country has been in the past. But um, uh, as the wealth of the India grows, and indeed it, its economic growth is continuing um, at a rate bigger than most countries in the world. And the amount of um, uh, alliance with the Western markets that is continuing to grow um, by uh, the NRIs in India and the knowledge that they're bringing back and the knowledge that they're now exporting out of India, uh, I see as a, a wonderful market. Um, and. Uh, those people that have relevant, those businesses that have a relevance to the Indian community, have got a huge market and a lifetime opportunity to grow a significant business. There is no doubt in my mind about that. But that was actually my next question, but uh, good you pointed out. But before that, I wanted to take uh, Garz and Arvinas' point of view in terms of uh, global brands uh, seeking interest. Uh, well, uh, I think uh, as uh, Gaurav and Rod mentioned that some categories have shrunken, but some categories have opened up. So in last four months, uh, I have spoken to, we as a team have spoken to many more uh, non-retail service-oriented companies, which were not there on our list before COVID. 
and those uh, brands and those uh, companies are looking at India. Uh, I mean, now they're open to. In fact, before COVID, they were not looking at India. So I think what has happened is there is a, there is an evolution which has happened, uh, especially in certain categories. There is a huge amount of interest both from the brand side to know what is actually happening in India and also from uh, potential uh, franchisees in India. There, that profile is also has evolved. As uh, Rod mentioned, a lot of uh, educated professionals who want to get into franchising, as well as mid-sized business families wanting to really uh, making diversification their priority. That has been my experience, especially in last four months. Sure. Yeah, and also, uh, just on a you know, this, uh, we've seen international franchising, and Rod, you've seen much more than we all have collectively seen, and. Uh, and we've seen in India, while India, when people look at India uh, earlier, it was only top companies of the world, which are very strong and the brands are already known and they've come and traveled. But in last five odd years, we've seen a lot of smaller companies, which probably would find India as the second country they're entering. I know we've seen companies from Dubai entering India. We have seen a lot of smaller countries. We have brands out of Thailand coming to here. We have seen brands out of Philippines I never thought, I mean, I just had an uh, opportunity to visit Philippines a couple of times and we were able to see a company who's getting interested on in coming in. So these are all coming in. While they are next part of it, some are uh, opportunist. You know, they just see an opportunity and say, uh, 1.3 billion people, let's go out and there must be something right there. And some are very planned. And I would uh, say that about 20%, 25% are very planned and very long-term uh, looking at the market. But rest are opportunist, and they are also very. You know, they have, I divide this franchise uh, brands into three parts. One the brands, uh, which are what we call the firm. So these are the three F of these global brands. One are firm. You know, they're very firm. They want this fee. They want this to be done. They would not allow sub franchising. There are a lot of things they would have to do in their structure. They are a firm. Second are what we see is flexible. You know, so they they want to see. They are ready to sign the first check. They are flexible in a lot of things. So they would they would agree on few things which can accommodate the, the master franchisee need. And the third F is very interesting these days. We see some companies that are freestyle, which means <laughs> they have nothing to do that. <laughs> they can change the format also. <laughs> so one of the companies on a lighter note is happy to even adapt. Uh, is a is a, a brand which has a, a, a Western food, but is happy to adapt to Indian food completely change the model and and some are you know we so they are a freestyle company so so but, but i i'm not too excited about the freestyle ones but the first two are uh, yes and, and Gaurav, i i think you're exactly right there in fact i i have what i describe as an 80 20 20 rule um and, and i just reinforce your fact that you can't be too rigid because you're coming from often from a place that you know well into a market that you don't know and it's all very well to arrive in uh, 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 Mumbai um, or, or in Delhi uh, or in Bangalore and, and take a trip around to the restaurants and uh, um, uh, feel that you've been there when you stayed for a week you understand it. There are so many layers in the business and uh, my 80-20 rule is this. Um, the core of your business, your business model, 80% of it should be able to be translated into the market you're going to. So if you want to go into India and you have a business model, 80% of it should be transfer, transfer, transportable into the market. 20% of it, you must be prepared to jettison, right? And 20% of it, you should consider your master franchisee as your potential partner and your local knowledge expert and the local market expert and rely on them to add part of the formula that's going to make you work. Um, and uh, I know that from my experience <clears throat> in consulting, and I know what you do uh, as Franchise India um, uh, in uh, India, the advice that's necessary to help franchisors understand the Indian market will be critical to the success 
of, of any brand. And so if any of the listeners and viewers are looking at going into India, I would absolutely recommend you talk with uh, Veena, Sachin and Gaurav because they have a huge depth of experience, um, not only in how to actually market franchise opportunities, but what the business model needs to look like to be relevant to the consumer. Equally, I think India is also gaining, uh, just to picking up pick from there, also having now after very long, and I know you invested many, many years where nobody really came to India. I remember from the times of uh, uh, early 2000 to uh, as late as you know, uh, last year. So we, you've been making a lot of these attempts to educate Indian franchisers to even look at going global. And I can tell you that this is the time where this is already have started happening. So we have not many, we are not like Australia where you have about 35% of brands which would look at overseas markets. India still would have a very small percentage of that, uh, but we would have very credible companies. And there are a lot of fashion companies which are now see that they have big change happening in India through online and other things. And these markets are done. So they are talking about uh, getting into uh, say African markets and so on so forth where their business can be more relevant. We have a lot of education brands which are looking for Southeast Asia expansion because they feel that a lot of Southeast Asia markets can be done because India is very good on edutech. Uh, so they're uh, technology based in, mm. uh, in home uh, education and multiple other opportunities are coming in. So I, I really feel that this is for our audience, especially some of good companies that are looking for some global expertise, maybe can reach out to your office and take some some share of your time and and maybe a position because sometimes these companies have no uh, real uh, understanding and uh, uh, about the global markets it's uh, it has to be a very long term strategy and i know how you led cartridge uh, as a very simple business uh, which can have a lot of uh, you know control issues and so on so forth took it to a becoming global company uh, maybe a little bit on some of the brands which you've done, what kind of case studies you've done. It'll be very, very uh, for our audience. If I, if, I, um, if I give you some examples, um, <clears throat> in, our, in our business at Cartridge World, our business changed significantly from an in-store refilling business but um, into a, um, a, a product manufactured in China under license and distributed around the world. Uh, uh, we are now uh, looking at growth through acquisition and uh, we're going out to buy companies in the market, uh, buy our competitors um, uh, and we're also very, very interested in diversification into new businesses associated with the B2B customer that is that now our customer base. And Gov, to your point, um, for those Indian businesses looking at expanding, um, I would seriously consider uh, having a process that we use at, with brands coming into Australia, and you could apply this throughout the world, uh, and we develop a market entry strategy uh, for the business. And it's not simply a matter of how do you sell a master franchise, <clears throat> but looking at the bigger objective is how big is the opportunity for your brand or your business model in our market or in the Australian market or in the US market or in the New Zealand market? Um, and then determining what's the best way to get there. And we've found a very, very successful market entry strategy. And I would encourage businesses coming out of India or looking internationally and also businesses that are coming into India and looking to establish a foundation to look at the opportunities of purchasing an existing player in the market. Right? Uh, you might take on part of their executive team or all of their executive team and have that local knowledge to which you can then blend your business to. And I can give you a specific example of that. <clears throat> um, one of the businesses I'm involved in as a director is Poolworks. Poolworks was a Brisbane-based, Brisbane, Brisbane Australia-based pool cleaning 
and Pearl service business under a single man in a van. That business developed into the market leader in Australia, um, over 110 retail outlets that are hubs for service vehicles that are maintaining the pool health and quality and lifestyle of families that own pools. Um, four or five years ago, we decided to make a market entry into the US and we bought a small chain it had four corporately owned or five corporately owned stores and about four, three or four franchise locations. And we purchased that chain, <clears throat> operated for a while under its existing name to sort out the employees and, and what knowledge that we wanted to impart and, and how valuable they were. And then what we did is we converted the brand to the Pillworks name and started to grant franchises by converting the company stores to franchise. Um, that business is now relocated to a major uh, national support office in Dallas, in Texas, um, and is a real contender in the market, growing very rapidly, converting existing businesses um, into the uh, into the Pearl Works brand. So uh, not a lot of Greenfield franchises, are being granted the conversion of existing businesses, independent businesses, to the Poolworks brand. And I, I think the point that I make, and uh, um, uh, I endorse what you're saying, uh, Goro, that, that there is many opportunities in international markets to enter the market. <clears throat> and while the direct entry and the establishment of a corporately owned store is certainly valid, the grant of a master franchise is certainly valid. The, the grant of an area development, the grant of a single unit might be valid. Don't forget a direct entry in the form of an acquisition. And each market will be different. And as I'm sure that, that uh, I've learned in India, right, uh, the market is enormously diverse in India and you need to understand your way around it. Well, each country in the world similarly has different um, market drivers in those marketplaces and uh, you need to adapt your business model to do so. And uh, uh, I think that um, a lot of people in the coffee business know the Starbucks story. Um, Starbucks was a, a great success around the world. It arrived in Australia and spent a small fortune building stores only to find the business model wasn't sustainable and the consumers didn't actually like the brand product and the way it was presented. Um, uh, ultimately, um, that business was licensed off and Starbucks went to grow their markets in other parts of the world. So we need to, be, uh, we need to understand that there are significant opportunities, but each market and each opportunity has within it its own solution. Um, and uh, Gaurav, I like your 3F um, scenario, but I think that being flexible um, is very important. It's all very well to be rigid and say, this is what I want. Um, but uh, if that's not relevant to the market or it doesn't meet the market in terms of what other competitors in the market for those same dollars are offering, then uh, you'll hold out your hand. It's like owning a piece of real estate and saying, I want $5 million for it when the market, uh, similar products in the uh, homes in the street are selling for 4 million. You can hold out your hand for five, but you're not going to get it. Absolutely. And I think I'd, I'd take one takeaway from you that, uh, and there would be a huge amount of opportunity in consolidation in the, in the international market. And I feel that the good players should look at an opportunity to find great assets available in other markets, which would, which can give them through acquisition a good market entry and a lot of uh, learnings, which take years and years. Uh, because when you do an early acquisition, uh, then you get a lot of inherent learning of the consumer and, and so on and so forth. So it can be a huge strategy going forward for companies. Mm. Another market entry that, we, um, uh, that, that we've actually applied very, very successfully 
is a joint venture model, depending on where the, the, the capabilities of the organizations are, um, uh, looking to joint venture under a master franchise arrangement. Uh, and so rather than sell off the rights to the, um, uh, the, the south of India or the north of India, um, uh, look at the opportunities of a joint venture um, uh, because the opportunities in that market are so great, um, your opportunities to expand uh, are almost unlimited, but your capital may be limited and that will prevent you from growing. So thinking about joint ventures under a franchise model um, in, in a new country is a great opportunity to again make a market entry. Absolutely, absolutely. You're mute. Sachin, you're mute. Would it also have some inherent risks? You know, uh, look, I, I, I think there are risks. And, and one of the biggest risks, um, I believe, uh, is the people that you choose to do business with. Right. Um, uh, we often see in franchising that the focus is on selling the master franchise or selling the proposition or selling the single unit franchise. Um, but I remind everybody of what I described as many years ago, I coined by what I describe as Young's first law of franchising. And that is every franchisor gets the franchisee they deserve. Ah, I like that. Yeah. And so if you're an opportunist and you simply want to sell a master franchise, you're going to have to live with whoever you've sold it to. And the most successful brands in the world and our approach at DC strategy to how we bring a brand into a market is by focusing on the individual or the corporation and doing your due diligence on those organizations or individuals, ensuring that there is alignment between the parties as to their goals, um, uh, ensuring that the capital is not only available to establish the business or pay the master franchise fee, but to have the working capital to grow the business in the future and that the individual or corporation has the capabilities to add that 20% uh, of the business model that you will need to go into a new market. Um, and, and Sachin, I, I believe that that's the greatest risk. Um, uh, the other risks revolve around your due diligence and the judgment uh, after being in a, a city or a country for only a number of weeks or months, determining that you know it all and uh, the consumers are going to love your product. Um, it's very important to draw on some local knowledge of what potentially could be the, the downfall of your business in terms of uh, it's risk, if it's in the food business, it's supply chain, uh, it's flavor profile, uh, who its customer base might be. Um, they become execution risks of being overly optimistic that um, uh, everybody is going to love your brand and flock to your store. And so one of the key things that I, I look to try and manage that risk is define who is the avatar of your customer or client and how are you going to actually attract those clients to you? Because business development and customer development um, is all about, if you're a retailer, it used to be all about retail, all about location. Now it's about location and online presence and your supply chain to keep the product and services up to the consumer demand. So understanding what the local consumer needs 
whether it be a B2B, a business, or it be a, 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 a domestic customer, is a very, very important consideration. And it's one of the greatest risks of assuming that everybody will buy your product. And, and testing of that, I think, is enormously valuable. Uh, and uh, consumer forums uh, are excellent to give a reality check to what's going on and what the potentials are. Uh, you know, uh, last two questions before we, uh, we tap it up. One of the key questions that I wanted to know and one of the reasons that we started this forum is to bring forth uh, some, of the, some of the leading consultants. And you've been, you've been, you started this about 35 years back and, you know, have, have global exposure. Your message to a lot of consultants, professionals in this, this audience, uh, you know, some of them who want to pursue this, this study. Look, I think my, my greatest um, bit of advice is um, don't think you can get rich by riding on the back of your client. Right? I, I think it's very, very important that you remain interested and focused on the outcome and the benefit your client wants to achieve. Right, um, and it's been a view that I've had all of my life is understanding what the objectives of the client are and what are the objectives, not only from a business point of view, but when we're talking to the shareholders or proprietors of business at the highest levels, right, what are those shareholders or what does that proprietor want to achieve in his business life and also in his personal life, what sort of work does he want to do and or she wants to do and how is it going to transition over time? By understanding what your clients are looking for, you then understand the golden rule of consulting. You will never get what you want until you help others get what they want. And uh, my view has been and how we've approached building our reputation at DC Strategy is, is working on the basis that let's build huge enterprise value for our clients and success for our clients. And then, and only then, can we bask in the reflected glory of what our clients have achieved. Or you consult a lot of consult, um, franchise professionals, experts. Uh, one one learning you you would remember with uh, working with Rod in previous times. No, I think uh, I've learned a lot lot of things from Rod. I mean, I personally uh, some things we would be sitting in audience and when Rod would speak and we will all be quiet observer for what he's doing. I what I learned one very important thing from him that he he has an ability to uh, simplify a lot of complex things and he goes across very easy. And this is what I think one of the areas which a client is always looking at, you know, so they have some complexity and they need solution and solutions which can go across. And one of the areas which I learned in this, that uh, a good consultant is somebody who would be able to uncomplex things for clients. And also I, uh, one thing I particularly liked about what he used to do, he's extremely disciplined as a, as an entire thing. And for 20 years, somebody would not change in them the way he conducts himself, how disciplined he is. And he's, he'll always show up if he has to speak in a, in a place, he will show up at least half an hour before he's more prepared than anybody else in the room. So all these are very important. These are called DNAs, you know, some you born with and some you actually acquire over the time with experience and working in multiple continents like he's done. And what are you, what are you you're coaching? Very, you're very team? kind, Gaurav. You're very kind. <clears throat> and what Sorry, are you coaching you? James? Uh, your, your son's now uh, in the business, so what are you coaching him these days? Hey, look, that's, uh, that's also given me a great deal of satisfaction. Uh, um, I said to son James, uh, I was always a great believer in, uh, in your children uh, being uh, actively involved in uh, some activity rather than... Uh, uh, staying at home in bed. So from a very early age, uh, James was with us in uh, Franchise Expos, handing out brochures uh, 
um, in his uh, his new shirt and tie. Um, and James now heads up our recruitment business. Uh, I, I actually didn't originally hire him. I, I I didn't want to hire a novice, so I sent James out to learn franchising, and um, uh, he oper worked in operations with uh, uh, a business called Harehouse Warehouse, which uh, uh, became uh, a franchise of the year and a very big brand. Um, he then pioneered the opening of the first store in Sydney, um, and then bought the uh, area development license for South Australia and moved over there and opened the first five stores. So by the time he came to DC Strategy, he was a very experienced franchisor and franchisee in his own right. And he now heads up our lead generation and franchise sales division, um, where we drive the, uh, the, the lead generation for organisations looking to come into Australia and find master franchisees or single unit franchisees, or franchisors either being developed by DC Strategy and then moving on to the franchise recruitment stage, or franchisors that are finding that there are challenges in their current recruitment process um, and we help to develop and improve that. And um, uh, he's also led me uh, to invest uh, with DC Strategy very heavily in very, very good IT. So uh, the way in which our leads are generated and then managed is a critical component of our success in recruiting, screening, and ultimately having our clients grant franchises. And uh, the franchise sales division uh, takes a prospective franchisee right from the NDA, right through the financial and legal process to a point where he's ready to sign or she's ready to sign a franchise agreement. Um, and it's been great to see. Um, and uh, I'm giving uh, James more uh, responsibility and authority as I am the rest of my uh, team. Um, uh, well, uh, I'm, uh, I'm looking to bask in the reflective glory of their success. Which is very nice, and I think that's what, uh, and it's a good learning, uh, you know, for for people to be uh, the uh, young should come out and now take your responsibility, and you continue to guide and mentor, and uh, uh, them in their uh, next leadership roles. Mm, absolutely, and you might like to meet James on a, a webinar, and he can talk to you about his experience in in franchise sales, right? Uh, not only in the Australian market, but in the global market because he's been involved in granting master franchises in quite a number of markets across the world. We'd love to bring James on one of our panels and, and talk about franchise sales because, and that should be fun. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I'd be happy to do so. I, I will find myself more closer to James because I am also more involved in franchise sales. <laughs> then... uh, at the end of the day, your know, franchise sales proposition um, is the important situation because uh, uh, we see many franchisors that launch franchises without real advice, without good consulting and legal advice, um, who have a proposition that just don't cut it. But um, uh, they're enthusiastic about their business. But uh, one of the approaches that I have in just finishing is we look to position ourselves in the top quartile of the business opportunities in a market uh, for the capital involved. Because if you're not positioned, your brand is not positioned to offer a business proposition in the top quartile, you'll be struggling to develop your franchise business because there are other propositions better than it. And being able to benchmark where you are and then build your proposition accordingly gives you a great opportunity to grow your business. Absolutely. One of the questions that I'll take up uh, from the audience is uh, on the on sustainability, which you're saying, uh, and how do you build partnerships? Uh, well, well, this question is a very universal question, and this is uh, usually asked, but how, how would you want to address this? 
Uh, in terms of how do you make your business sustainable? Sustainable and how do you make the partnerships more robust? Um, look, uh, in terms of sustainability, I believe it's about constant innovation. As we all know in business, what we did when we first started our business, and I'm talking to every person in the audience here, right? Um, you had a unique niche in the market that you built your market. But I'm sure you'll share with me that um, you'll agree with me that along the way, you've created many, many competitors. Um, uh, many of the people that are involved in franchising in Australia, right, um, uh, worked within our organization at some point, right, uh, be they consultants or lawyers. Um, in the cartridge world business, um, we must have spawned at least 50 different global brands. Um, the boost juice business in Australia that's now expanded right across the world, during the peak, there were 28 juice bar brands competing in the market, all of them copying a player. So the key is that whatever you're doing will become commoditized over time and copy over time, and you must continue to differentiate by innovating. Now you've got to look and feel different to the consumer, and you've got to keep close to the consumer to understand why the consumer wants that. Because your consumer is changing. Um, there is a new generation of consumers coming up. So uh, the, the, the sustainability of a business is directly aligned with the innovation that you make to your business and understanding as your customer segment ages or grows, where are you going and how are you going to replace that customer with a new generation of customers? And it's a challenge for every business. In, in terms of the, uh, uh, the other part of the question, right, um, um, uh, uh, we're talking here about human relationships uh, and that comes down to communication. Um, and I often sit down with franchise owners and ask the question, what's your exit strategy? What's your objective between now and when your uh, objective strategy is reached? What is the period of time before you want to exit? And often franchise partners or franchisees or franchise associates have actually not had that question asked of them. And many franchisors actually don't know what the objectives of their franchisees are. And understanding what your objectives are um, as an individual are very important. And then the franchisor can work with you on a plan. And that plan might be, look, I've worked in the brand for seven years, I'm just getting tired. But uh, you have two options to work with that individual. Uh, one might be, well, look, why don't you take a three month holiday and we'll see how we can help you manage your business during that period. Or, if you're just over your brand, our brand, right? Why don't we help you put the business on the market and sell it, right? Uh, now, the challenge in franchising, as you grow from one, two, or three, or four franchises to 50 or 100 to 150 or 1,000, is who have you got in your organization asking that question and those series of questions to every franchisee and do your operations team actually know the answers to those questions? What's the objective of the franchisee? What's his time frame to exit? Right? And, and how is he feeling in today's environment? If you know those things, you can then look to communicate in a way that's going to help them achieve their objectives. Thank you. Thank you, Rod. Thank you, uh, panelists. I mean, uh, we've run out of time, so uh, this has been a, this has been a great session. And uh, you know, uh, uh, thank you each one of you to have taken time out, and thank you, audience, for uh, for your.
for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to have one big, big session and uh, uh, we will we'll work on some big, big workshop, maybe whenever you have time. And we bring in only top CEOs of uh, all uh, companies who should look at how they should look at the things of constant innovation when value creation. I think this is the thing which we have actually taken from today's discussion. And how do you inbuild in innovation and value creation in, in franchise organizations? I'd be very Thank happy you. to share my view on that with you. Thank you. Thank Anytime. You. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. Have a wonderful night in India.